uh, the Walter Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence is kind of the new kid on the block as far as discovery is concerned. I'm the director, and we're concerned with the implications of artificial intelligence. Is, for example, Skynet going to take over someday and uh, make us all slaves? Are we going to be pets in the future? But we also are dealing with things such as the mind-body problem. Is the mind the same as the brain? So both artificial and natural intelligence. And we have, uh, we have a lot of fun doing that. We have a website, mindmatters.ai. That's the discovery website, mindmatters.ai. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about this book, The Mystery of Life's Origin, Reassessing Current Theories by Charles Thaxton, Walter Bradley, and Roger Olson. This is 35 years. We're celebrating the 35th year anniversary of the release of this book, and it addresses the origin of life. Do we have any scientific understanding of what the origin of life was? Spoiler alert, 35 years ago, they said no. That is not the case. We do not have any scientific understanding of where life, the original life, could have, could have originated from. It is an evolution. It is where the first life originated from. The Bradley Center is very uh, excited to release this book, which is available on Amazon.com on Monday, but it is also available here uh, if you want to buy it today. In fact, at I think it's 4.45 or so, uh, the authors of this, Thaxton, Bradley, and Olson, will be at the table and signing copies if you'd like to get a copy of it. Now, just to update things, there have been some chapters added from people that know about biology and the chemistry of the origin of life. We also have new chapters by Jim Tor, who spoke here last year, an incredible synthetic biochemist who, is, uh, who, who, who knows this stuff very well. Steve Meyer, who you heard from previously, and you heard about Steve's, the, the impact of Charlie Thaxton on Steve's belief in intelligent design. Uh, Jonathan Wells, the author of uh, his latest book, I love the title, it's called Zombie Science, that, uh, that, that science keeps rising from the dead, even though it keeps getting killed by intelligent design. Uh, and then there's uh, Guillermo Gonzalez, who has uh, co-authored the book, The Privileged Planet, with Jay Richards, and Brian Miller at Discovery Institute. There's also a great chapter in here by... Um, by David Klinghoffer talking about the impact of this book, which is incredible. I think many of the, many of the leaders of Discovery Institute were actually, uh, they, they were inspired by this book. Uh, and he, he points, for example, about the person that actually corralled this together, John Buell, who was with the Foundation of Faith and Ethics. He was the one that sparked it and got these three authors together and wrote this monumental, uh, monumental uh, book. Uh, Steve also talked about De Dean Canyon, who was one of the early proponents of the idea of uh, life emerging naturally in some way. And this book and other things changed his viewpoint on that, and he actually writes the foreword to that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a panel discussion with the three principal author authors, the original Thaxton, Bradley, and Olson. But first we're going to hear from Dr. Walter Bradley. Uh, Dr. Bradley is the namesake for the Walter Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence, and we are writing a biography about him, and the foreword has already written, been written by J.P. Moreland, and it's going to be released later this year. He has led a remarkable life. One of the things that we did is we solicited comments, testimonies, from people whose lives have been impacted by Walter Bradley. Instead of me introducing him, I thought I would read some of these comments that we have. William Lane Craig, who is the, of course, the uh, Christian apologist, philosopher, head of reasonable faith, said, Walter Bradley is one of the most extraordinary men I have ever known. If you want to find out more, the rest of his testimonial is in the book. Jim Tor, who we just talked about, said, Walter Bradley fearlessly led the charge for faculty to unabashedly stand up for their Christian faith on campus. And he's right, Walter Bradley had an impact all over the world about Christian professors coming out of the closet and living out loud for Christ. And then Hugh Ross, Reasons to Believe, said, one of the greatest blessings God has granted me in my life is, is to have co-ministered with Walter Bradley among faculty and students on university campuses across the U.S. and beyond. 
So you can see that not only is uh, Dr. Bradley very well versed in the chemistry of the origin of life, but he has also had an incredible impact in a Christian ministry. So without, without further ado, as they say, let me introduce to you my good friend and my hero, Dr. Walter Bradley. privilege to be here with you. It's always dangerous to have such a nice introduction because then it can be a big letdown for the audience as you go through, go through your talk, get the expectations too high. I have to confess I've given over 5,000 hour-long lectures in my life because I was a college professor for 44 years and then did quite a bit of speaking outside of that. This is the first one I've ever given for 20 minutes, okay? <laughs> So I feel a little uncomfortable, and at 20 minutes, I'm just going to quit. I'm not sure where I'm going to be, but uh, I'm, used, I'm, I'm programmed to speak in 50-minute clips, okay? And so I shall do the best I can to do that. And then this is compounded by the fact that it's after lunch. Now, I, I have real statistical data from having taught 1 o'clock classes at the university that 1 o'clock is a terrible time to teach because the students overeat at lunch, and then they come in and all their blood rushes to their stomach and they're sitting up there kind of, Whoa, you know. I might probably see some of you doing that today too. I, I confess I didn't have lunch because I don't want to be doing that up in front of everybody. <laughs> but uh, faith and science, it's a very, very important question. And I think that, uh, let me share with you a, little, so a couple of statistics that I hope will help you to be glad that you took the time to come. Most of you are aware of an organization called Barna that does all kinds of surveys, uh, really trying to benefit Christian uh, churches, Christian ministries, about trends in the culture and how we can try to be aware of those and maybe adapt uh, in how we address them. Uh, several years ago, maybe 12 to 15 years ago, he did a survey having to do why do college students lose their faith in college? And we, it's, it's very statistically significant that that's a trend that's coming and it's getting worse. Uh, when they did the last survey, 33% of the kids who lost their faith in college and never came back to the church, or at least haven't, uh, uh, said that their primary reason was conflicts between faith and science. Now, the most recent study is kind of alarming because that number has gone from 33% to 51%. And so the trend's in the wrong direction. So I think what that says is that when you're here, I, I live in a retirement community, Sun City in Georgetown. Now, and I talk to a lot of my Christian friends there, and uh, they have some interest in this, but not enough. And I tell them, do you have children? Well, yes. Do you have grandchildren? Yes. What do you think is going to happen to them? Uh, not sure. My next door neighbor said, I raised my three sons in Christian schools. They went to a Christian university. Today, none of them go to church, and they don't take my grandchildren to church. Isn't that heartbreaking? After And I can tell. He's almost bitter about it than I would be. He said, I spent $150,000 sending them to, <laughs> you know, and it didn't work out at all. And, uh, but we don't want that to happen. I think for all of us, whether your own personal interest is high in the area of, of faith and science, uh, I think it's a topic about which you should know at least something. Now, I want to mention that there's two kinds of problems here. Sometimes the problem is due to atheists who give misinformation. But frankly, sometimes the problem is Christians who get misinformation. And if you're going to talk about faith and science, try to do enough homework that you really get it right because you can do more damage than uh, uh, good. If you're, if you're telling things, trying to defend the Christian view and so forth, and theistic view, uh, please don't be getting a lot of bad information in there and making the situation worse. We, we had over a period of time 20 about 20 kids that were atheists at Baylor and we got to be friends with them and we invited them over on Saturday nights to show movies and talk about issues related to God and life and so forth. And as we got to know them, it became very clear that some of them were there because they were in a family or in a church where when you asked certain questions, it was considered rude and inappropriate. Don't ask questions like that. Now, we don't want to have that environment in our churches or in our homes. We want to have done enough homework to be able to say, that's a really good question. And I, th I think I can help you with that. Okay, moving on. I'm used most of my time now. I haven't. <laughs> I've got a little more time. Uh, science magazines often publish 10 top unsolved mysteries in science. 
And every, I, every time I see one of those covers, I always want to uh, have a peek inside and see what the ten are in particular to confirm the origin of life is almost always on that list. It's often first. And it continues to be uh, an issue where I think people who work in the field, by and large, are honest enough to admit that we don't really have a clue how life began. And I'm going to share with you some examples uh, by quotes uh, at the end of this presentation to just sort of confirm that. When John Buell first contacted me and said, would you be interested in writing a... I should add, John Buell was a great mentor for me when I was in graduate school. Uh, he was the Campus Crusade for Christ director uh, at the University of Texas at the time, and we got to be good friends. And uh, he, uh, once I went into teaching and had a university job, he asked, would you be interested in writing a, a book on evolution? And I said, no, I would not. Uh, I haven't had any biology since ninth grade. And what we don't need are more bad books by Christians who don't know what they're talking about, okay? But then I made a counteroffer. I said, I don't know anything about the origin of life, but I have all the right tools and background. My PhD is in material science and engineering. I work in polymer science and engineering. I know lots about polymers. I just work with dead ones, not live ones, okay? <laughs> but the physics, the chemistry uh, is all very similar. And so I said, I don't know what the situation is there, but let me read up on that and see if it looks like it would be a fruitful place to, uh, to be. And as I began to read the literature, I was just sort of, I was shocked that that people really had no clue of what was going on and they weren't even making up bad stories particularly. Uh, they were pretty honest and acknowledging the situation and I thought this sounds like a, a topic I'd like to know more about and that uh, maybe if uh, I got enough lot knowledge about it to be able to uh, write a book. So that's kind of how I got started. I got two-thirds of the way or halfway through the book and uh, Charlie uh, Thaxton came to work for Probe and it was perfect because his background was biochemistry. That was the one area that I didn't have such a big background because I'm talking about dead polymers, not live ones, right? So his biochemistry background was, was excellent. And then we had some questions before we got finished having to do with what was the early Earth's atmosphere like? And uh, uh, those Miller year experiments and some of the research that's been done really makes sense. And Roger Olson, who uh, Ann and I had gotten to be friends with uh, uh, Candy and Roger, uh, was getting his PhD in geochemistry. How per perfect is that? Because it's, that's the really, in the, looking at the geology is one of the ways you be, try to infer what was the atmosphere like in the distant past. You can't go and measure it because it's not there. So they both uh, uh, agreed to join and we just had a great time. Uh, and I think both our complementary backgrounds, I think we covered the waterfront pretty well. Okay, well here's the objective of this presentation. I want to present key claims made in the mystery of life's origin in 1984, and I'd like to note which claims have been challenged by research in the last 35 years. How's the book doing? Uh, does it need lots of revisions? Did we say a lot of things that turned out to be wrong, or maybe worse than wrong stupid? Uh, no. Uh, that was uh, my hope, you know. Some of these questions you say, I don't really want them looking at that, but, uh, but anyhow, so the, they agreed to do that. and. Uh, uh, so here we are. So let's look and see what's been going on. I think the first thing that's really impressive to me and, and was a pleasant surprise because I'd seen lots of books that Christians were writing on evolution and in the evolutionary community I think there was a much, much bigger digging in of heels and sort of uh, uh, this is the way it is and you're wrong. In the origin of life community it wasn't that way because they really didn't know uh, what the real truth of the matter was, and they were honest enough to say that. Uh, as I got to know some of the people, I was really impressed with the fact that say, yeah, we, we don't know what's going on, and it really seems like a hard problem. Uh, when we got ready to get the book published, Charlie went around to find, or John Buell, I'm not sure which, uh, to see if they could get some endorsements from some people who were well known in the field. Uh, I think in today's world that would be very hard to do in the climate that we have, uh, particularly with regard to evolution, but I think uh, in the origin of life, climate was a bit uh, more open and more honest, in my opinion. Uh, and so here were the jacket endorsements that we got. Uh, this is from Robert Jastrow, founder and first director of the Goddard Space Institute for Space Studies at NASA, uh, and was a prophet at Columbia University. Uh, gold plate uh, credentials. And here's what he wrote. A valuable summary of the evidence 
against the chemical evolution of life out of non-living matter. It presents a very well thought out and clearly written analysis of the alternatives to the accepted theories of the origin of life. I thought that was very, very good. We were, tri we were really pleased. Uh, Robert Shapiro is another person that uh, uh, they found. Robert Shapiro got his PhD in chemistry at Harvard and uh, then he became a professor at uh, New York University in uh, uh, New York City. Uh, he was in process of writing a book called A Skeptic's Guide to the Origin of Life in the Universe, which was subsequently published in 1986. Our book came out in 1984. So it was kind of timely in a way because he was right in the middle of working this same question. And here's what he wrote. The authors have made an important contribution to the origin of life field. Many workers in this area believe that an adequate scientific explanation for the beginning of life on earth has already been made. Their, view, their point of view has been widely disseminated in text and the media and to a large extent has been accepted by the public. This work brings together the major scientific arguments that demonstrate the inadequacy of the current theories. Although I do not share their final philosophical conclusion that the authors reach, I welcome their contribution. It will help to clarify our thinking. That's pretty nice coming from a, what I think is a very thoughtful, uh, secular Jewish guy who is also a very, one of the leading people in the field. He died a couple of years ago. But uh, right up till the end, uh, he was studying origin of life. Uh, Dean Kenyon, uh, professor of biology at San Francisco State University, author of the pre bi pre Biochemical Predestination in 1968. He was the leading proponent of the naturalistic origin of life. When he was asked to review our book and see if he would be willing to, to have a jacket endorsement, I think he had, was so positive about the book and he was such a, a prominent figure uh, that he was asked uh, by Charlie, would he be willing to write a uh, preface? And here's what, it, this is a part of what he wrote. Arguments are cogent, original, and compelling. I like that. Yay. <laughs> Keep it coming. The authors believe, and I now concur, that there is a fundamental flaw in all current theories of the chemical origin of life. Notice he's talking about chemical origin of life. There's, bio, there's chemical evolution and there is biological evolution, and the chemical evolution is the origin of life. Uh, part, they're separate stories and have uh, different reasons. It is very likely that the research on life's origin will move in a somewhat different direction once the professionals have read this important work. So, God really blessed. I mean, we, I feel like the mus, uh, sowing of the uh, mustard, mustard seed, uh, you sow a small seed, the slowest, smallest one in the garden, and what comes is this great, big, huge bush. We had hoped that we would be able to, to, to write a book that would make a difference, that would get people to think, that would have some positive responses, and this is far more than what I would have ever anticipated just given how hard it's been in the evolutionary area, where I think the, the arguments and the pushback has been, uh, was, has been more challenging. Oddly enough, I was invited to do a debate with Robert Shapiro, the guy who's the Harvard chemist and who wrote a nice jacket endorsement for us in 1986. This was a, just before his book came out. We had about 1,000 people in attendance in Baltimore, and this was the funniest thing I've ever been at, at, a, at a debate. Shapiro begins his presentation by saying, uh, this will not be a normal debate because I agree with about 90% of what I would be <laughs> presenting in the debate or that I agree with 90% of what Dr. Bradley will be presenting in the debate, which he well knew from having recently reviewed the book. And so we had a fun night talking, but it really wasn't like a real debate. The only thing he had a difference with was he wasn't so sure that uh, somehow this uh, implied God. Although he didn't dismiss that as a possibility, but I think uh, at that point in time, that was the, part, the 10%. Uh, no real differences of opinion. And Shapiro continued to have uh, this view that the current theory of the origin of life as it had been being pursued was simply going nowhere, had fundamental problems, which is what we had been pointing out in our book, uh, and, and continued. I'll share a quote before we get finished uh, about that. Okay, uh, 
how to create building blocks for life. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, if you think about doing research on the origin of life, where would you begin? Um, I think the way that most people who have started in this area have begun is to say, uh, we, we know that living systems, even the simplest living cells, are pretty complicated. So what you would want to do is to make experiments and try to do what? Do this step by step. You would want to make some building blocks if you could do it under prebiotic conditions. You'd want to have experiments where you could show how those building blocks could be put together into uh, polymers, uh, polypropylene, that would, would be not uh, functional proteins because maybe the sequence isn't right, but at least they would have some of the same chemical structure and so forth. And so that's the, the approach that you would take. So the very first and, and uh, first successful experiment to try to validate the early theories of the origin of life were made by Miller and Urey. Miller was a PhD student. Urey was a Nobel Prize winning chemist. I suspect that Urey probably came up with the idea and Miller then did all of the hard work to uh, uh, see if it worked or not. This is how graduate school works, okay? <laughs> I once heard the expression sort of facetiously that, that we'll never be uh, even though we've abolished slavery, we'll always have graduate students. <laughs> and having been one, I can vouch for that. <laughs> but some of us escape, right? And then we go on to live uh, happily ever after. Okay, so in the Miller-Urey's famous experiment that was done in 1951, what they did was the following. They, they took some uh, gases, uh, ammonia, methane, and several others, uh, they were not gases chosen at random, and they were not gases chosen because there was a reason to think the earlier Earth atmosphere had these. They were chosen because they would be more likely to give the right answer, okay? If you're going to try to get a chemical reaction, what you want are some energy-rich chemicals to react. If you have in, uh, uh, molecules that aren't energy-rich, you can put them there until hell freezes over and nothing happens. And so, uh, being a Nobel Prize winning chemist, you already knew that, and so they put together what I considered some very energy-rich uh, chemicals. Uh, and then they made a little test apparatus. You've probably seen it if you've been through uh, books of science uh, in which they were going to introduce uh, these gases. Uh, they were going to have them sparked, uh, simulating what? Lightning as a source of energy to sort of help the chemistry uh, get, get going to get the reaction started. And then to look at the reaction products, it was being circled around and they had a, a little uh, trap where they were gonna catch uh, uh, the different uh, re reaction products, not, not the reactants. And, uh, and then they would chemically analyze those after the experiment was over. And lo and behold, they did get these gases to react. That's not remarkable. That's as remarkable as saying, look, water runs downhill. <laughs> Who would have thunk it, you know? <laughs> If you put energy-rich chemicals together, if you spark them, guess what? They're going to chemically react. So there was nothing particularly special about that. But they did, in fact, when they got to looking at the reaction products, they did find, indeed, uh, a lot of stuff that would, I, I would call organic junk. But they did find a small percentage of the molecules that were formed were building blocks uh, that would be precursors to developing uh, protein. Uh, or DNA or RNA, so they got, some, they got some successful and encouraging results out of, of that, though they did it with an atmosphere that was completely unrealistic. We can all be thankful that our atmosphere is not full of ammonia and methane or we would all be dead, but uh, if you hypothesize that, then you can do that, and so that was the first big deal. Now what's interesting to me is at the time we're writing the book, this is like 30 years later, and they're still trumpeting this as a big, huge step forward. And the reason they're trumpeting it as a big, huge step forward is they have no more steps, okay? <laughs> Seriously, they, they really weren't having success on hardly any other fronts. And so you look in the textbooks and they'll have maybe 150 pages or 100 pages on evolution and then they'll have two pages on the origin of life. And then those two pages will mostly be about what? Ammonia and methane chemically reacting. Who would have thought it, you know? The people who got in a town uh, close to where we live, uh, they had a big ammonia fertilizer plant that blew up. And it blew up about a third of the town. And it made the point very clearly that uh, uh, ammonia is very, very energy rich. It's very explosive. So sadly, some people got killed. But the point for us is what? 
lots of energy, provide a little bit of a, 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 a way to trigger that, uh, like a lightning, and you can have chemical, chemical reactions taking place. Um, so uh, that was still, and it is even today in some cases, being trumpeted. Uh, I had the opportunity after writing the book to be on textbook review in Texas for th three times in a row having to do with life science. And Texas is one of the few states where you actually have review. They, they actually recruit people uh, from the public at large to try to give uh, unbiased reviews. And so I was happy to do that. Uh, we worked in groups of four. And by being in a group of four, that was so that somebody who had a strong bias wouldn't be able to sort of uh, uh, recommend changing things unless there were other people that looked at it and said, yeah, that's a good idea. So I had three other people on the same committee that I was on as we were looking at the biology books and Part, not, we weren't looking just at the origin of life, we were looking at other things. But it was, it was great to have the opportunity to do that and to recommend that the, let's at least tell the truth about that experiment. We've been trying since then to get similar results on atmospheres that are not so energy rich but are more likely to have occurred. And guess what? We've not been success. There are no great success stories. But it, the least they can do is to say, yes, this was an experiment. People were all excited but it really wasn't a good simulation experiment because it was using the wrong atmosphere. It was, and it was an atmosphere that wasn't chosen by accident. It was chosen because we know these things will blow up. Uh, they will explode and uh, so there'll be plenty of energy to get these molecules to form. Uh, Roger Olson, one of my co-authors, uh, was able to join in on this uh, whole thing as we were writing the book uh, and do it in a more uh, in-depth way because of his background. Uh, he's a geochemist. You may never have met a geochemist, but it's people who do chemistry, but particularly what? On rock formations and the kind of things that geologists. So it's kind of a hybrid between being a chemist and being a geologist, which is perfect. If you're going to say, what was the atmosphere like five million years ago or two million years ago or, or so, how are you going to get that? You can't just go out and measure the atmosphere today. That's not going to be very helpful. But what you can do is that you can look at uh, what I would call fingerprints in the rocks uh, because uh, what things look like uh, when they're being formed, when rocks are being formed, will be influenced by what the atmosphere was at that time. And so you can infer from that with the right experiments and, and right knowledge, you can find out uh, what, uh, what's going on. And so uh, Roger was able to go back and do this. Now here was the critical question. Did we have oxygen in the early Earth's atmosphere or not? And it turns out that on that question turns even uh, additional potential problems with having a early uh, naturalistic formation uh, of the building blocks. Not, not, we're not making proteins yet, we're just trying to make building blocks, but even to make those was very dependent on whether you had oxygen. Why? Because oxygen itself is very reactive and you probably couldn't get the other chemicals to be available if you have oxygen there, it would oxidize everything and it gets a bunch of dumb oxides and they don't really work very good in living systems. So Roger was able to study that and to be able to, to verify that the, some of the key questions about what was the atmosphere. If you're gonna run a simulation experiment, then you should really run it with the atmosphere that was there at the time. So these are the kind of things that we have, have been involved in in the process of writing uh, this book. The I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to jump past all the really interesting stuff that you would have enjoyed. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I've, I've, got to, I've got to tell you one story, and I'm going to take... I think they didn't reset this when I started, so I'm going to try to do another minute or two. <laughs> Can I negotiate that with somebody? I don't know. I'm, I'm not going down. Not till I get... <laughs> not, I'll finish when I'm finished. Uh, in, in 1986... Uh, the International Society for the Study of the Origin of Life had their worldwide meeting in Cal Berkeley. And uh, it was my great opportunity to be able to go to that meeting uh, uh, and to find out what was going on uh, at the time around the world. They had 500 people come, and that was probably almost all the people in the world who were uh, serious uh, researchers in the origin of life area. Uh, I actually uh, had two papers that I was allowed to present there. 
But what happened at the end of the conference was something I've never, ever seen anything like. Robert Shapiro, that name should sound familiar, he was what, one of the people that gave us a very generous endorsement uh, on our book. Uh, and he's the keynote speaker to close out the conference. So 300 people are all there. We're all excited to hear what he's going to say. And he starts with saying, people think that RNA, uh, the theory at that time was RNA, it's really hard to make DNA, maybe we could make RNA, and if you don't know the difference, don't worry about it, because I can't explain it, I'm, a, I'm out, out, of, out of time. <laughs> I can't explain it, I don't have time to explain it, okay? But, uh, so, uh, he basically said, there, there, people were assuming at this time that the uh, RNA had been made in the lab laboratory under prebiotic conditions. And that was in the literature. He took a, a reference from 1986. No, it wasn't, couldn't have been 86. Yeah, I guess it was 86. So he, he took a reference from there and it referenced somebody in 1985 and he looked and somebody there said, oh yeah, we, RNA has been made under prebiotic conditions and they referenced somebody else and they referenced somebody else and they referenced somebody else and it traced all the way back to 1968. All of it kind of merged back to one paper. And if you read that paper, it says, we tried to find it, but we didn't find any. So, <laughs> now that's stunning, isn't it? I mean, this is like gossip. You would think scientists don't do this, but it's like it was gossip that uh, favored a certain hopefulness uh, about how life began, and so it, it had a lot of uh, followers. But then Shapiro went on, and he did something that was really amazing. He said, I'm going to spend the rest of my talk explaining to you why making RNA under prebiotic conditions is impossible. And he went through, and with a very thorough, careful, without getting into all the chemical details, it, it basically said, there's not just one or two reasons, there's about five or six reasons why this is never gonna work. And uh, at the end, the, the, well, at the end of presentations, they always have questions, right? Any questions? Silence. They're, person who's chairing the thing. Any questions? Any questions? Can you? <laughs> no questions. So finally, and this is a fellow who's the head, he's the chief editor for the origin of, uh, uh, the origin of life and the evolution of the biosphere. So he's a very important person himself. So nobody will even ask one question. 300 people, they're all the famous researchers around the world. And here's them sitting there stunned and not able to sort of even, even question anything that he had said. So he turns to uh, Robert Shapiro and he says, Bob, he said, I don't disagree with anything he said, but do you have to be so pessimistic? <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> he just gave five reasons why this isn't going to work, or, you know, and then you say that's being pessimistic? I don't think so. Okay, now I'm really out of time. Uh, I'm going to read you four wonderful quotes that are more interesting than what I was going to tell you. In the meantime, boy, I had a long talk for a period. See, I'm not, I've never done a 20-minute talk or 20 minute talk before. I'm going to have to practice. Okay, so this is a guy who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2009. Uh, and here's what he recently was quoted as saying It is virtually impossible to imagine how a cell's machines, which are mostly protein based catalysts called enzymes, could have formed spontaneously as life arose from non living matter. Explaining how life began entails a serious paradox. That's pretty strong. I like that. Uh, George Whiteside, most famous, most, I shouldn't say famous, most cited scientist in chemistry in the whole world in 2012. So that means he was writing a lot of papers, and uh, when your papers are cited, that means other people read them and think they're, they have something important to say. Some people write a lot of papers, and nobody reads them. But Okay. <laughs> Uh, here's, here's what he had to say. I don't understand how you go from a system that's random chemicals to something that becomes, in a sense, a Darwinian set of chemical reactions that are getting more complicated spontaneously. I just don't understand how that works. And then he did a TED Talk. If you, uh, TED Talks have really interesting things sometimes, and they're only 12 minutes, so if you don't like it, you didn't lose much time. But, but in this one, he begins by, he shows... He has a big bowl of chicken soup, and then he has a really cute uh, picture of a chicken, and the, the chicken's looking at the chicken soup, and he says, the origin of life is like, how do you get the chicken soup to become a chicken? Isn't that a cute, <laughs> isn't that a cute analogy? 
Yeah, that's what we're talking about, reverse engineering, okay. Robert Shapiro, now, Robert Shapiro is writing this in 2003, maybe it's even later than that. It, it re reflected his thinking all the way till he died, but uh, much after uh, he had reviewed our book by about 20 years. He, he says, a profound difficulty exists, however, with the idea of RNA or any other replicator at the start of life. Existing replicators can serve as templates for the synthesis of additional copies of themselves, but this device cannot be used for the preparation of the very next such molecule, which must rise spontaneously from an unorganized mixture. The formation of an information-bearing homopolymer through undirected chemical synthesis appears to be very improbable. And then finally, and surprisingly, Richard Dawkins. Does that name ring a bell? I, I don't know that he's the world's smartest atheist, but he's the uh, world's loudest atheist. <laughs> and uh, uh, he writes books, and he goes around and talks, and he's all, of, all pretty caustic about it, too. Not, not sweet at all. Uh, here's what he says. The universe could so easily have remained lifeless. It is an astonishing stroke of luck that we are here. That's a big concession, isn't it? Coming from him, I mean, that's a really big concession. A stroke of luck, that's a great explanation for how we got here. Okay, I am out of time, I apologize, and you'll get a shorter break to make up for it. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Uh, I am moderating this session, and before we do, I'm going to introduce our other two speakers, although they've already been uh, amply alluded to. Uh, on our far left here is Charlie Thaxton. Charles Thaxton is a fellow of Discovery Institute, the, Chemical Inst uh, the American Institute of Chemistry, and the American Scientific Affiliation, as well as being a member of the American Chemical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. He received his PhD in physical chemistry from Iowa State, and then later did postdoctoral work at both Harvard and Brandeis universities. He's the co-author of The Mystery of Life's Origin and also The Soul of Science uh, with uh, uh, author Nancy Piercy. And then on our, yes, and uh, sure, we'll clap for Charles. And then on our far, far right, and these are not political designations, uh, is <laughs> Roger Olson. He is Senior Vice President of the global consulting, engineering, and construction firm CDC Smith. He received his PhD in geochemistry from Colorado School of Mines and is a board certified environmental scientist by the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. He has authored dozens of scientific papers and co authored The Mystery of Life's Origin. Gentlemen, it's great to have you all here together. I wanted to start with a, a story that echoed yours about the uh, International Society for the Origin of Life, and then it, it comes with a question. Uh, when I was a PhD student, after having met you guys, I was in Cambridge, and my PhD supervisor was someone who had written a, a dissertation on the history of origin of life research. And uh, uh, actually, actually, this is my master's supervisor and then later PhD examiner. But she told me after coming back from the 1989 ISOL meeting that she'd had a candid conversation with some of the other, with some of the scientists there, and one of them had said to her that, uh, they said, Harmka, the, the whole field is becoming populated by quacks. Everyone in the field knows that everyone else's theory isn't working, but they're unwilling to admit it about their own. And uh, I, I was wondering, I know uh, at least two of you have attended those meetings in the past, how were you received with, uh, by, by specialists in the field, knowing as they did your particular point of view, that you thought that there was evidence of design and that the chemical evolutionary theory just wasn't going to work? I'll tell part of this, and Charlie can tell the other part. He can tell the funny part. So. Oh, you're you're doubling up because you're sorry. You're on. You're on this. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how could I follow? How could Bad I design. That? Okay. Uh, so there's. Uh, they have conferences, special conferences called Gordon conferences, and they're special because they're very one topic. Most, if you go to most uh, meetings for. Uh, science cell have a whole bunch of different topics and a whole bunch of different kind of parallel tracks. And uh, so when we, uh, our book came out, we were anxious to go and see if anybody at the conference had read our book. You know, it's, 
the purpose was to get, uh, hopefully, not just Christians to read it, but to get non-Christians to read it, and especially people who work in the field. But that's a pretty tall order, and we weren't really sure exactly how to go out and sell those things. Uh, stand on the corner and see if somebody looks like they're a scientist, kind of bad hairdo, you know, <laughs> ugly clothes and so forth. But uh, <clears throat> so when we were there, uh, we both had people come up and tell us that they had read our book. And when, of course, what do you say when they say that? Well, what did you think? Uh, or you can say, didn't you love it? You know, sort of <laughs> make it harder for them to say something ugly. But uh, 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 all the people that I talked to, which was four or five, had read the book. And they said that, well, the conference only had 100 people, and we didn't have all the time to be soliciting while we were there. We were supposed to go into meetings. But um, so I got very, very positive uh, comments. And I think Charlie had a similar experience with one notable exception, so you can tell. Well, when I went to uh, the same meeting, and um, these organizations, they love to pride themselves of being interdisciplinary. But at this particular one, all the chemists were at the table I was at. The geologists were at another table. The biologists and biochemists were over at another table. And so we were talking about the origin of life, and, and uh, I happened to mention that uh, uh, one of the men said, well, you've written a book. Tell us what you th about it. I said, well, <laughs> you've read it. What do you think about it? <laughs> so I didn't want to be on the spot right there. And uh, so he told me, he said, well, he said, we, we found it, the chemistry was, was, was very good. And I said, well, what about, what about the biologists? They said, oh, they don't know any of the chemistry. And uh, <laughs> so I, I said, oh, is that why we're over here together at the chemist? And they said, yeah. He, he said, they like to stick together, and we do too. And another thing got the same thing about, about all that. I think this is what you were talking about, the funny one? Yeah. Um, if you don't tell it, I'm going to tell it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a chemist who, there who was the one of the, who was, later was the president of the organization, and um, I asked him. I said, "Have you um, you read our book? What do you think of it?" Because I had sent him the book a few weeks before, a few months before, and he said, "Well, he says it's too damn sophisticated to be supporting creation." And I said, "But what did you think of it?" <laughs> <laughs> He said, he said, the chemistry is pretty good. Uh, he, I, says, he, I said, but you don't like it. No, it's supporting the wrong people. <laughs> he, yeah. He's the editor of the main magazine, or The Origin of Life and Evolution of the Biosphere, and I thought, such a nice, impartial, you know, yeah. uh, guy. So. Uh, Roger, I'd like to get you in on this. And uh, one thing I don't know, having known you guys for a long <laughs> time, I don't really know the backstory of how you all came to work together. It's rather unusual to have a jointly authored book by three authors. Sometimes you get two authored books, but pulling three folks together to come up with such a beautifully written and coherent uh, argument and scientific thesis must have been quite a feat. How, how did you work together? You didn't have, uh, there was, a, was an email in those days. How did you pull this feat off? And Roger, maybe you could start by giving a sense of how you got pulled into this as the, the geochemist. Yeah, thank you. It was, a, it was quite an adventure. Um, Walter Bradley at that time was a professor at the Colorado School of Mines and I was a lowly graduate student. And he knew he needed Not in my department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, another department. He knew he needed some help with the, uh, as he mentioned previously, uh, about the what was the starting conditions on the ancient Earth, the atmosphere, what were the conditions uh, like, and and also, uh, so he he coerced me in, into to writing uh, those parts and. And at the same time, I took a stab at a couple other parts, uh, particularly on the uh, molecular chemistry uh, and on the protocells. And subsequently to that, uh, Walter was meeting. We had a first draft out with John Buell, and, and, and he had had Charles Saxon look at it. And Charles Saxon says, you're missing all the chemistry. <laughs> so uh, Walter turned surprise, to him. Surprise. Walter turned to him and says, well, you're the ideal person to write that. <laughs> oh, I was 
supposed to chime in also? Yeah. yeah, so Charlie, how'd you coordinate this Motley crew and get everybody uh, yeah, producing well, one coherent manuscript? I, I, I think we all had a similar experience about that. Uh, I was a low man on the pole to start with because I had just come to Probe and John Buell laid the manuscript on my desk and says, here, read this. It was right after I got there. And so I, I read it and I went, came back to his office and said, well, why do you bring, bring me this manuscript? He said, well, we think about publishing it. What do you think? I said, well, I said, it's got some good ideas in it, but it needs a little more chemistry. And so he said, well, he said, I'm going down to A&M next week. And Bradley had, and, uh, and had just moved to Texas A&M. And uh, so he says, I'm going down there next week. He said, why don't you come with me? And you can ask him yourself. So I get there, and not only does his wife, Ann, meet us at the door, but uh, Roger is there as well. And uh, so I, we all come in, and um, the next day we have a meeting, and um, I explain it. And so about the same time after they asked me the question, after I asked the question, um, they both turned to me and said, well, you're the chemist, you write it. <laughs> and that's how I got involved. I wasn't planning to write anything. So I, I got, I got dra dragged into it too. <laughs> yeah. He looked like a sucker. No. <laughs> we could get him to fix it. Make, make every. No, no. Feedbacking again. Oh, okay. <laughs> Walter Bradley, professor of engineering. No. <laughs> I should add, we did have chemistry in there, but it was not the kind that Charlie liked. It was physical chemistry, and he was more of a biochemist, and so he he probably felt like, well, there's this big missing missing piece, and there was. And uh, so we were very happy to have him do that. I couldn't have done it even if I'd spent time trying. Just because that wasn't my background. I'm working with dead polymers, biochemistry, right? To get the bio part. Yeah, it's talking about uh, stuff that would be quite different than when you're making uh, parts for automobiles, right? Where uh, there's no bio in that. So, Charlie, By I the wonder way, before if we, we get any further, I better explain something to you. In case there's anybody wondering, why is that guy wearing that hat up there? I just, if, and I noticed that every time I've ever been to a meeting, Michael Behe wears his hat. And I wanted him to know that I could wear one too. <laughs> oh. yeah. And it makes you six inches taller. I, I should get one. <laughs> Let's get back to the chemistry, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Tour, Jim Tour, has made a point that, Charlie, you first made to me when we were having discussions after your book had been published and I first met you in 85, which is that the chemistry does not seem to want to do on its own what life requires to get going. And um, uh, Tour has written these terrific articles now recently, one of which is included in the, in the re-release of Mystery, in which he shows that that you have to start with to get life or chemist, chemistry moving in at least a life friendly direction, not all the way to life, no one's ever done that. You have to start with purified reagents. You have to introduce them in a precisely choreographed way. You have to remove certain reaction products so they don't create interfering cross reactions. You have to heat certain things up to certain temperatures and cool them down quickly. And if you allow them to, certain reactions to keep going without stopping them, they're going to end up in a terrible sludge. And that this whole process is beautifully, uh, to, to move even a few steps towards life, you have, to, you have to, well, intelligently design the process. It's got to be choreographed. And I wonder how much your awareness of that kind of problem played in your decision to float the idea of an intelligent cause in your philosophical epilogue. Because I know that was a, perhaps the most controversial part of the book, to say, well, maybe we've been barking up the wrong tree. Maybe chemistry can't create the code of life. Maybe what we're learning from these simulation experiments is telling us by our uniform and repeated experiment, ex, ex, experience that there's an X factor. And that X factor seems to be, well, maybe it was intelligence. What was your thinking? Why did you guys decide to take that really dramatic step at that point? Nobody was talking about intelligent design in 1984. Was that part of your, 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 the logic of it, or was, were there other things? I think at the outset that we anticipated that when we understood the details, the details would have some missing connecting pieces, and that those missing, I think, uh, are purposeful. I think God often leaves fingerprints, 
uh, for our benefit. Uh, I like the passage in Romans 1 that says that evidence for the existence of God is clearly seen in the things that have been made so that they, uh, do not believe, so they who do not believe are without excuse. And we kind of felt like that uh, I wasn't at all surprised. I would have actually been surprised had we found, oh, we've explained how life began. Well, I could have gotten a Nobel Prize, but I, I, it wasn't my intention to try to do that because I, I felt all along that God has done it in his own way. And he certainly has uh, his patterned way of doing things, what we call the laws of nature. I don't like the term laws of nature because it sounds like they're autonomous. I like God works in his customary way and that's the so-called laws of nature. And uh, he does some things in an extraordinary way and we call that a miracle. And uh, so it's good to keep those distinctions straight. I was once being deposed by the head of the ACLU for one of these what can you teach in school things. And he began by saying, Dr. Bradley, uh, you believe in God, is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, he said, well, uh, how, can, how can you be a really good scientist if you believe in God? Because then you just think everything's a miracle. And I said, no. Uh, I'm the one who has real freedom because I believe God works in, in patterned way, which we call the laws of nature, and in an unpatterned way, which we call miracles. So I'm perfectly objective in how I do my science. It's people like you and the people you represent that are the problem. Because no matter how the answer comes out, they're going to have their own answer and it's going to be, it just happened, right? And so I think that... Uh, uh, and, and people like to think there's a lot of arrogance. We can be arrogant too, but I think I've met a lot of atheists who think they're smarter than they are for starters. And, and secondly, they're so self-assured that they're the ones that are being objective and they don't really realize you've assumed the answer before you ever even started to look into the question. How can you possibly consider yourself as being objective? You're not objective at all. Charlie, what was your thinking about including <coughs> that uh, first formulation of intelligent design though it wasn't yet called that in the, in the epilogue? Because that was a big step, wasn't it? Well, it was, but <coughs> I had... Uh... In examining all the experiments we were looking at, I noticed that every single one of them, you couldn't have anything happen without the investigator. That was the first start. That's where I, where I began. How come the investigator is the one who, get, who really ought to get the credit? I mean, after all, who bakes? if you bake a cake, you put all the ingredients together, who gets the credit? Do you get the, the temperature? Do you get the, the, uh, you know, the oven? The, I mean, you know, all the other factors? No, you, you, you give it to the baker. The one who puts it, puts it together and make, that makes the decisions. And the same thing happens with a guy that gets a Nobel Prize for a synthesis. It's not the chemicals, it's not the energy, it's not the various uh, things that happen there, but it's the one who knows when to cut the temperature, when to add this, and when to do that, and when to do whatever. And so that's the one who is supposed to get the credit, but every single one of these origin life chemists were trying to give credit to nature. And that was such a glaring contradiction to me. Kind of blinders, huh? And that's yeah. when I began to say, well, I am going to change things. And I went to um, a, uh, an American Chemical Society meeting one night in Dallas where we had maybe 50 to 75 people present. And I gave my standard lecture on the origin of life, a history of the origin of life, how it all happens uh, historically. And then I got to the end of that evening, toward the end, and then I had the discussion about the DNA chemical code and, uh, and how the fact that there are certain sequences and they have to be in the right pattern. And so I said, it, who gets the credit for all that? Nobody said a word. And, and so then somebody else had mentioned earlier and I picked up on this, I said, if you write a sentence on the board that says this sentence wrote itself, would you accept that? No, absolutely not. But we all agree here, don't we, that life itself produced itself? Happened, happened by itself. Chemicals made the life. And so they knew that wasn't right. And so after that, I began to say, I've got to write this down more, at, more, more that way. And that was when I began to um, think through philosophically of all the other issues involved. And so we wrote the epilogue, I began to say, in terms of intelligent cause. That's, that's what got me connected to the, the, the Darwinian and Lyellian tradition in historical sciences because they wanted to know to reconstruct, they wanted, to, in order to reconstruct the remote past, 
They wanted to appeal to our uniform and repeated experience. But these very simulation experiments by our uniform and repeated experiences showed the need for intelligence to get things moving in any, any life Right. friendly direction. Roger, I wanted to ask you, and then we'll get these uh, Chuck, or Charles and uh, other folks into the questioning. You were still a, a PhD student at this time. Was this decision to take this step to you know, breach the, the, the principle of natu methodological naturalism and, and suggest the possibility of an intelligent cause, was this unanimous? You had perhaps the most to lose at that point in your career, not yet even having the PhD. Yeah. Just your, de just your degree. <laughs> um, well, actually, you know, I had put most of the work together while I was a graduate student. I was also uh, teaching there for, for three years, but you know, I actually presented the lectures in the chemistry department about what I thought, and so they already knew what I thought, but uh, my degree was actually granted in, in 1979, and the book didn't come out till 84, so I was safe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, safe to get the degree, but still vulnerable as a young faculty. Uh, yes, and, and from there, I, I, they didn't offer me a permanent position, which I was kind of uh, interested in doing, but it was, it was actually uh, good that they, they pushed me out in, into the, to the actual industrial world, and, and I ended up in, in, in the consulting business um, eventually, where, where I could do a lot of uh, work, uh, improving environment for people around the world and being able to talk to them freely about you know, how I believe and the things I believe and, and hopefully by, by doing those types of works they could ask me, well, what do you actually believe in? And, and I could tell them that you know, there is an intelligent source out there and even go that step further and say, well, you know, who is that intelligent source? Well, it's the God of the Bible, right? Good. All right. <clears throat> Let's get some members of the audience into this, and uh, yes, go ahead. Hi there. I haven't read your book. I'm sorry. I just realized it existed today. Um, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. The problem of the origin of biological homochirality has been significant anytime you talk about origins, um, and it's been largely unanswered for a very long time. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Donna Blackman and Soren Toxavard and some others in the last couple of years have been really touting autocatalysis slightly based off of the soy reactions. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the viability of that model. He was, yeah, I'm, I didn't quite understand. He's asking about homochirality, which, which for the audience, oh, uh, oh. The, the amino acids and proteins that I was telling you about, uh, there are two different types of amino acids. There's left-handed amino acids and right-handed amino acids. They're mirror images chemically. And to make a protein, for some reason that has not yet been fully explained, all of the amino acids must be left-handed. And then all of those amino acids must also connect with a particular type of bond called a peptide bond, though only about 50% of the possible bonds are peptide bonds. So the probabilities, and this is something that Walter explored in 7, 8, 9 of Mystery, uh, the, the improbability of all those things lining up mounts pretty quickly, exponentially. Yeah. And then in addition to, there are sugar molecules in living organisms, and they're also chiral. They have a right and a left-handed version. And for some reason, the sugars in life all have to be right-handed. And so this has been a big, just a part of the mystery of life's origin. And this gentleman's asking a very astute scientific question about some recent work attempting to solve that problem and wondering what the panelists have to, have to say about it. Yeah, I actually haven't read it, so I can't comment on it, but I'd be happy to get the reference when we're finished so I can find it. Yeah. It's been a big problem for a long time. I, I, I could just, just yeah. say, Jim Tour has reacted to some of that in some of his recent papers. One of Tour's essays is in the reissue of Mystery of Life's Origin. You might have a look at that, and you might also have a look at his work at the journal Inference, uh, an international review of science. He has two recent articles on the origin of life, and he's addressed the chirality problem there in recent research. So, very good question. Thank you. Uh, my question is much more of a softball. Uh, <laughs> Good. I like that. Better. Not nearly so smart. Uh, I understand the book is coming out, or a new version of the book is coming out. I was hoping you could talk about uh, why you felt uh, the book could be re-released here 35 years or 36 years later, uh, and uh, if there's new content in it or new, uh, uh, new uh, material. And then, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bradley, you started to talk about, while well, you were reviewing whether any of the conclusions were no longer valid. Uh, and I was wondering if there was any output of any of that. So in other words, just, you know, why, did, why are you republishing and 
yeah. and maybe some context around that to help you sell yeah. more books, maybe. I, I, think, <laughs> I think there have been some interesting developments since we wrote the book. Uh, in a way, it doesn't change the conclusion that we come to in the book, but I think are, they're interesting enough that they ought to be addressed. And these are things that happened after uh, the book was published. I would say, uh, uh, for example, uh, RNA World uh, was just beginning to kind of come onto the to landscape. And instead, of, the problem with with yeah, with uh, Origin of Life when they were, at the time that uh, we were writing the book was it was protein first or DNA first, and the problem was they couldn't make either one of them. Okay, uh, RNA was meant to be a uh, better a bet because it was one molecule that was going to do the work of two different molecules. So the probability of that was uh, why it looked attractive. But uh, there was an article published several years ago that was on uh, RNA world 50 years later. And basically the whole article said it began by saying, making RNA under prebiotic conditions is a synthetic chemist's worst nightmare. And uh, that didn't sound like after 50 years, we'd made a lot of progress. But I think it's worth uh, keeping track and following what's going on because at this point, I, I believe that God did this in a combination of, of what I would call uh, his patterned way and an extraordinary way. But that I may be wrong. And if, if they found a way that, that this happened in terms of the laws of nature, that would not upset me. It would simply say, God did it this way instead of that way. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was particularly interested in, in the updates, in particular my field and all the other fields, and, and we really complement the, the supplemental chapters that have really brought it up to date, but really almost confirmed everything that, that we, we, we originally said. You know, in, in one place, I, this is the, again, the chapter I wrote on, on two chapters on protocells, there's really been no no explanation or no link between any assemblage of, of, of molecules, even if they could have existed, and anything that looked like a, a real, real cell, and, and that will continue to be without, you know, more and more uh, interference or intelligent design going into these experiments. The, the, the other thing that, that I said in, in my particular chapter about the oxidizing environment has, has been proven even even to exist probably more emphatically than, than it did at that it's time. Generally accepted, I think. Yes, generally accepted, uh, even more oxidizing than we may think. But, but, but the last thing was, um, particularly when did first life appear on the earth? And I kind of made the bold statement back there from all the evidence uh, that it was almost an instantaneous thing, that it, that it appeared very, very quickly. Uh, because in a lot of times when you looked at all the complicated molecules come, come together, time was kind of the hero for the secular science. The more time we give in, the more probable it, it's going to happen. But, but when I looked at the evidence, the evidence point to the life has always been here. And it was interesting to, to pick up a, a 2017 article where some secular scientists, they actually came out and said that it, life was almost an instantaneous emergence of life on the planet Earth. So again, just confirming things that we, we originally said. I'm going to sneak uh, one in here, right? Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, Charles. Following up on the various problems with the, uh, this, the chemical evolution scenarios, the various ones, I remember shortly after you wrote the first book, the first edition of your book, uh, I read an article, I think it was Scientific American, that said it began with this comment, and I'd, I'd like your comment on this, about the only thing we know for sure about chemical evolution is that it happened. Can you, can you comment, uh, is that still the, the idea b behind most modern versions of chemical evolution? It's completely impossible, but it must have happened. <laughs> yeah, that is the materialist assumption. But unfortunately, there's not that much evidence that supports it. Not even, I mean, the, you, one of the articles that was added to this, I think, is, it points out that hardly anything about the original atmosphere that was assumed has been supported, and almost it's all universally rejected. And we were tentatively stating those things in 1984, 
And now the, the people who are writing the text are boldly stating it. So they don't even accept that. However, in high school biology textbooks, they still refer to the methane environment, don't they? But there's no, there's no real evidence to support it. Some of the textbooks are, are actually saying what the atmosphere was for the Meliori experiment. But they often will now add that the really Earth's atmosphere could not have been with these chemicals. It's, it's, it's not thermodynamically possible. And so, and then they will go on to say these other atmospheres unfortunately don't work very well. <laughs> Again, surprise, surprise. They took the dynamite away, took, you know, can't get a big bang out of it now. <clears throat> yeah, this is a piggyback a, on Charles' comment and unpack that a bit more. Uh, it's obvious that if life is here, it must have originated somehow. But it's not obvious that it must have originated by a purely material and undirected process. And I think one of the things that the work that these three gentlemen did in mystery was expose those underlying materialistic assumptions that were driving the field, which, made, which opened up the space, the intellectual space, to consider the alternative possibility that we may in fact be looking at evidence of design. And that's where I built on their work. And uh, the, the five chapters we have at the end, we, uh, Jim Tour has done a terrific job replacing the role of, uh, of um, Robert Shapiro, who used to be called Dr. No. Dr. No. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Jim is now playing that role, saying that no, chemistry says no, sorry. In my final chapter, I've developed this uh, argument that they floated in the, uh, the uh, epilogue by showing that our uniform and repeated experience actually shows there is a way to generate information, but you always need a mind. And that's actually, in a way, the message of all of us is listen to those simulation experiments, the results, more carefully. Take them more seriously. What's the missing element that makes them work? It's always intelligence. One more thing. One more thing I wanted to ask. I wanted to add to this. The main reason why we wrote the why we're the public coming out with a new release of the book is that there was a whole new generation of people that didn't know about it when it was written. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people were reading about it the first time 35 years ago, and then it went dormant for some years. And now people who read it now they say, "Wow, that's still pretty good." It's even a, even a prettier cover this time. Very good. <laughs> very good. Very, very good. good. Very I think good. John very West good. wants to close this down. Thank our panelists and thank them especially for their amazing contribution.